Welcome, everybody. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I have the privilege of welcoming each and every one of you on behalf of the university to our Faculty Researcher of the Year Lecture, which is held this year in the School of Pharmacy for a very important reason. The winner resides here. Uh, the lecture is a uh, long-standing tradition and to my mind, given the nature of our university, it's one of our most important traditions. Uh, I am very proud of UMB's research enterprise. We all need to be proud of it. Uh, it's a commitment on the part of our institution not only to disseminating knowledge, which we do in our education mission, but to creating it in the first place. Uh, to expanding uh, the boundaries of what we understand and contributing to a body of scholarship that will improve lives or as in our simple mission statement improve the human condition. So when you look at the work of Dr. Linda Simone Wastilli and her fellow scientists you see and you will see today uh, that in our discovery there's compassion, uh, in our curiosity, in our creation of new knowledge, there is a major element of caring. Uh, so much of what we study uh, is very bound to the people for whom we study, uh, the people we hope will benefit from the investigative work that so many of you, so many of us do here at this university. And that is certainly the case for the person we're honoring today. Uh, and so I thank all of you uh, for dedicating yourselves to the research mission. Uh, and in doing so, uh, you really give a gift of kindness and hope uh, to lots of people that you and I will never see, will never interact with. It's a great, uh, it's a great task that we have. We're privileged to have it. And so without further ado, uh, I want to ask Dean Natalie Eddington to come to the podium and formally introduce our honoree today. Natalie? Good afternoon, everyone. It is such a pleasure to see so much of our university community here to celebrate one of our own. Dr. Linda Simone Wastilla, professor in Park Davis Chair in Geriatric Pharmacology in the Department of Pharmaceutical Health Services Research and director of the Peter Lamy Center of Drug Therapy focusing on research. Uh, for those of you who know Linda well, it is a well-deserved honor. Dr. Simone Wastila embodies the spirit of an outstanding researcher. During the 20 years at the School of Pharmacy, her research has evolved into three pillars of excellence. The first represents fundamental research into mental and behavioral health issues and vulnerable populations, such as children, the elderly, and minorities. Her body of research in this arena has informed her work in the second pillar of excellence, which is policy. For five years, she has supported the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene as its director of its statewide epidemiology outcomes work group. Through this service, she has focused on drug abuse, providing data on use, treatment, and consequences to DHMH, which used her findings to create data-driven and treatment interventions. Linda's third pillar of excellence touches on how we practice healthcare. In her most recent work, funded by the National Institutes of Health, she found that patients that had both COPD and depression were less likely 
to take their COPD medications. This finding tells all healthcare professionals to be mindful of the medication adherence of their patients with both of these diseases. Through studies like this, Dr. Simone Wastella, as a researcher, is having an impact on patient care. Her research is marked by more than 100 papers, over 48 research awards, including 31 as principal investigator. She has three active grants as PI that have been funded for more than $1.4 million. And as a dean, those numbers always make me happy. <laughs> Outside of the research arena, uh, she is a beloved educator and mentor to scores of pharmacy and PhD students and postdoctoral fellows. She is a valued collaborator. <laughs> she is a valued collaborator, as evidenced by the letters of recommendation that she received for this honor. And she is also a writer, not only of grant submissions and peer-reviewed journals, but also of poetry, short stories, and novels, many of which explore health, and in particular, the societal and personal facets of medication and medicating. Dr. Simone Wastilla has a portfolio of innovation, of creativity, and results all of which support her selection as this year's University Researcher of the Year. Please welcome Dr. Simone Wasilla to the podium. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm really pleased and honored to be here today and, and, and quite um, nervous. I want to thank Dr. Perman and uh, Dr. Eddington for your very, very kind words. I, I'm a little overwhelmed, but I will try to deliver with my talk here. My talk is on balloons and umbrellas and outliers. Um, what I'm not going to do today is scare you with statistics. I'm not going to talk about my study findings, and I'm not going to discuss the minutia of methods. Instead, I'm going to talk a little bit about policy research, why I do this type of research, and why I think the research I do is important. I'm going to use the non-abating problem of prescription drug use disorders as a focus for my talk. It's my passion, substance use disorders and mental health, and I've been doing it since I was a kid in the PhD block, so my dissertation was about. So what I am going to talk about today is balloons, outliers, and umbrellas, and just a little bit about subjectivity in research, because um, subjectivity is there, and it's inherent in what we do, and it's important. But before we plunge into the details, I want to talk a little bit about policy. What is policy? In healthcare, when we think of policy, we typically think of laws and regulations a government has passed down, such as the Affordable Care Act, or the mental health and substance use disorders parity laws. But policy can be more nuanced, more discreet. It can be a change in a formulary that affects a patient's access to and cost to a particular medication. It can be a change in the way deductibles are calculated. It can be a change in best or recommended practices, such as the lowering of the threshold for cholesterol levels or the frequency of mammograms that should be conducted. Of course, such changes influence your practice and your relationships with your patients. And if you're a researcher, it will definitely affect the way you measure what you're trying to do. Pharmaceutical health services research, which is what I do, but I do it with a policy focus, is interested in what happens when laws, regulations, or guidelines relating to pharmaceuticals are implemented. How do these changes influence access to and information about specific medications? What happens to providers, policymakers, and most importantly, patients, when we implement a policy? When policy is passed, we think of the things that policy is intended to achieve. Increased access, improved quality of care, reduced cost. These are the anticipated outcomes, the intended consequences. But always there are things that happen that aren't 
are not anticipated, what I call the unintended consequences. And it is these unintended consequences which have always piqued my curiosity and fueled my research. For example, let's talk about pain. We all have it. Our patients have it. Maybe you, your family members, your friends have it. People who endure chronic pain. And by chronic pain, it can be cancer pain or non-cancer pain, such as arthritis, lower back pain, sickle cell pain, multiple sclerosis and pain associated with fibromyalgia. A headache can be the worst. If you have frequent headaches, I can assure you your quality of life is likely to be low. In the past couple of decades, there's been a tremendous shift in the way we treat pain. It used to be a stigmatizing condition. In the last couple of decades, it's opened up. Physicians have become less wary of treating individuals with pain. In fact, it's become, pain has been considered the fifth vital sign, at least until this past summer, when the American Medical Association decided to remove pain as a vital sign. And the reason is it's considered because of the burgeoning opioid overdose crisis. There are lots of ways to treat pain. There's meditation. I do it. Physical therapy, exercise, massage, yoga, acupuncture, TENS, neurofeedback. Most of these modalities are not reimbursed by insurance. And there are medications, there's over-the-counter products like aspirin and ibuprofen. Those also aren't usually reimbursed by insurance. And then we have prescription medications. These are usually reimbursed by insurance. Some, some of the medications we use are antidepressants. But there's also more potent stuff like oxycodone, hydrocodone, morphine. And these therapies um, are very effective, very potent, and they have a lot of problems associated with the use if used inappropriately. There's also some therapies you can't get from your physician and you cannot get from your pharmacist, but you can get almost every street corner in every town or city in this state, and that's heroin. And that heroin may be alone, or it may be laced with fentanyl or carfentanil, but you can get it. And it's obviously going to be cheaper than a lot of the substances like TENS or neurofeedback that might not be reimbursed by insurance. We know that heroin will ameliorate your pain. Unfortunately, it may do so in a very permanent way. I'm going to talk a little bit about outliers. But before I talk about outliers, I want to talk about data. And before I talk about data, I want to talk about population research. What is population research? Well, it's the stuff I do. It's what a lot of people in my department do. It's when we take large amounts of data, or any sort of data, and we try to make inferences about a population. For me, population research means research that impacts the public in some meaningful way. That means that all, which means that all of, which means although individuals are affected, your findings and your outcomes aren't extrapolated to an individual. Rather, the findings are assessed at larger aggregate population levels. And of course, the public is the broader population. We measure the public's health with data. There are lots of people, so there are lots of data points. As researchers, we tend to look at how to summarize the data. That's what we pay to do. That's what we have statisticians for, to help us summarize and describe the data. We massage it. We squeeze it into shape. We try to, anyway. And we describe it with words like mean and median normal and skewed distributions. Our task with these sometimes millions of observations is to whip them into a form we can recognize and describe to our peers and to patients, to policymakers. Most of our observations behave. But we have those on the ends that sometimes refuse to conform. These data points are what we call outliers. Outliers are a person or an event or a thing that is situated or detached away, detached from the main body or system. And because they are different, we don't always know what to do with them. When it comes to outliers, the first thing we need to do is to make sure the data are actually measured accurately and correctly. Assuming that it is, then we have three options typically to deal with outliers. The first one is to drop the outlier. It's just too weird. It's not clear. The other one is to transform it using, say, a log normal transformation or something like that to make it all linear and neat. And the third one is to maybe use a different analytic approach, maybe a probit model instead of a logit model, take care of those rare situations or whatever. But there's a fourth option that a lot of times we don't think about. 
And that is to actually keep the outlier. Keep the outlier and let the data tell the story it's supposed to tell. I remember um, about seven or eight years ago working with a particularly stubborn set of outliers. I was doing some research for um, what was then market scan, um, Thomson Reuters, I guess, and I had a subcontract to look at mental health and substance use expenditures so they could use it in their uh, annual projections of expenditure for mental health and substance use. And I was trying to focus on the drug stuff because that's what they didn't have expertise in and I had a little bit of that as a pharmacist. And I'm dealing with all these health expenditures using their data set and um, came to find out that there was a handful of observation points, data points, where the spending, the total health, annual health expenditures for this handful of, out, of people, of the data points, was at least five times greater and up to 40 times greater than the approximately 4,000 per year health expenditures that the rest of the population had. And so I was really flabbergasted what to do with this because if I kept the outliers, if I took the outliers out, mean spending went down quite a bit. Median spending went down too. It was always lower than the, the mean. But if I kept them in, it was very inflated. So what to do? And so I sort of struggled with that because what is the story? We, uh, to give these data to actuaries who are going to actually sort of project what the resources are needed at the national level to deal with mental health and substance use treatment. And so we ended up actually presenting the data both ways. But what happened to me that day, looking at all these graphs and different distributions of these data, was I had an epiphany of sorts. Um, I don't have epiphanies very often, but I had a big epiphany then. It was sort of really changed the way I think about the work I do. My epiphany is this. Data points are people. That sounds really obvious. Data points are people. Of course they're people. But for years when I'd worked with all these data, and I've worked a lot with big data sets, um, it seemed like more like a medium like clay or cookie dough or, I don't know, um, paint. You know, just something that you worked with and you kind of pummeled into shape. It was sort of like sand at the beach. You know, you go to the beach and you have a bucket of sand, but you never think of the individual grains of sand. But for that, that, for some reason that day in that particular project, it's like those outliers were people. So three things came out of that epiphany. Um, I had a new respect for outliers. Rather than think of my outliers as nuisances, which they typically had been up to that point, um, I came to realize that outliers were actually what I needed to pay attention to. Outliers helped me identify the untoward effects of policies, both desired and the adverse impacts. It also helped me to identify the people who might be most vulnerable to any changes to policy change as well as those who might benefit. Because as you know, outliers are on either side of the distribution curve. The second thing that came for me from this epiphany was an understanding that my job was to translate these data points, particularly these outliers, into meaningful findings that benefited the people who the data represented. And the third thing was I understood that my data tell, told a story. And I was given the responsibility of telling that story which is a huge responsibility, I, I, I think, to assume as a researcher. So for those of you who know me well and who work with me, you know, you now understand why I'm always asking you, what's the story behind your data? What is the story your dissertation or grant proposal needs to tell? What is the story in this manuscript? I want you to tell the world so that they will understand. There's a data points of people. Sorry about that. I guess we decided to put this in So, as I noted before, policy affects individuals, but it doesn't affect just one person. Policy affects populations, which in turn are comprised of individuals. So it's a different di it's a difficult dialect we're dealing with right now. Individuals and populations, populations comprised of individuals. But it's important to keep in mind as you do any sort of policy research. To truly understand how a policy influences health, it's important to consider the people who fall under that policy umbrella. There is the population that is affected, there is the, that is affected in our pain example, there is the population um, um, that, that in our pain example before people in the balloon included those who experienced chronic pain and who either 
received or didn't receive adequate management for that pain. But then we think about an umbrella, and an umbrella is bigger than a balloon, obviously. And what we need to do with that balloon is um, remember that the, um, that the umbrella spreads even more and includes people who aren't necessarily affected by pain, but may be affected by poor layers around pain. For example, we might include, we have to remember that it includes people who use opioids but don't have pain. The umbrella spreads even further. It includes a population which may or may not have experienced pain, but experience dependence on pain relievers, who experience, um, who take care of people who are using pain relievers. And also, shelter, also taking shelter under the umbrella are individuals who seek out opioids, be they prescription or illicit, to reduce, to reduce euphoria. Finally, under the umbrella are what we call stakeholders. These are individuals, agencies, firms, governments, etc., who have a vested interest in policies intended to change the management of pain. Some of the stakeholders I've mentioned um, include patients with pain, patients with substance use disorders, prescribers and pharmacists, the pharmaceutical industry, state governments, federal governments, foreign countries, the Food and Drug Administration, the Drug Enforcement Administration. Those are just a handful of the people who are, or the groups that have stakes in what's going on with our opioid overdoses. Stakeholders are key to policy research, identifying who they are and what their potential interest and proposed policy changes can help identify the effectiveness of a policy in achieving its intended outcomes. It also can help to predict where unintended consequences, both desirable and undesirable, may occur. When it comes to ivory tower, when it comes to policy, the ivory tower is obsolete. As a noted astronomer, George Coyne said, I hope I'm not given the impression of an ivory tower science. But for me, science is an attempt to understand. It's an attempt to understand the universe. And that's how I think of um, science. It's just it's our curiosity trying to make manifest what we don't quite understand. Because policy research affects so many people, has so many, has so many stakeholders, it requires multiple perspectives. You can't do it alone. To truly understand how opioid policy in this country works, for example, I need to understand the perspectives of all these different individuals who are affected. Stakeholders, such as treatment providers, prescribers, drug enforcement, educators, pharmacists, and most of all patients. And those patients include both those who have pain as well as those who suffer from drug, drug use disorders. I also need to understand how policy researchers are defining and measuring terms like prescription drug abuse, addiction, problem use. I can't do this work alone. I'm not smart enough to do it. I really am not. I don't have enough perspectives. Um, and it certainly is much fun or meaningful to go solo in the research endeavor. It used to be, but it's not anymore. And that's why I'm glad the ivory tower is obsolete. So how do I do it? I actually don't do it. I just surround myself with brilliant people. I surround myself with brilliant colleagues and epidemiologists, my students, my postdocs, my staff. I mean, I am lucky and blessed to be surrounded by people who happen to give a darn as much as I do and who have a passion for the work that I do. In research, there's no such thing as pure objectivity. We like to think it is. Science is objective and art is not. But I don't think there's anything about being objective in science. There's no decision that you ever make in your research that's 100% objective. Everything a researcher does is tainted by subjectivity. It starts, subjectivity starts when you decide to apply to a college, when you decide to find a major. Um, the questions you end up asking as a scientist the data you choose, the way you choose to frame your hypotheses, they're all subjective. The outcomes, measures, and the covariance you decide to include in your models and the models that you choose to run, all subjective. Research is personal. But I want to also offer that subjectivity is not a bad thing. In fact, it's a good thing. It's the personal which provides the passion, the questions, and ultimately the answers. But I do believe it's important to acknowledge what your, prefer your preferences and biases and how they enter your work, or it will not be taken seriously. 
And it's a very fine balance, I think, for policy researchers in particular to not balance over too far from the research and into advocacy. And that's a particularly tough balance, balancing act that policy researchers have to undertake. I suspect for many of you here, what you do has personal motivations behind it. How you got to where you are, and there's a lot of personal reasons why you do it and how you got there. What I want to do now is um, introduce three of my doctoral students. Well, one of them is no longer my doctoral student because he actually got his PhD within the last couple of weeks, Dr. Cooper. But um, I want to introduce them to talk a little bit about their stories and how research is personal because um, they have remarkable stories. You're not going to get the whole thing, but I've gotten to know them, obviously, as being the, being the mentor for the last few years. Um, they both, all three, have remarkable stories. So I'm going to introduce them. Um, I'm actually just going to introduce them all here, and they can come up one after one. But the first is Patience Moya, and then Ida Kuzakan, and then Bilal, Dr. Bilal Coker. The other two are shortly behind. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Patience Moyo, as I was introduced. I am a PhD candidate in PHSR. I have had the honor of being a mentee to Dr. Simone Wasila for the past four years, almost four and a half years now. And I'd like to spend, spend the next two or so minutes talking about how I got to the program and why research is personal in my perspective. I, I am an international student. I am Zimbabwean. I grew up in a small town called Bulawayo, which is in the southern part of the country, pretty close to South Africa. I, while growing up in Zimbabwe, actually, I, I observed some of the real threats that, the, that poor resources and the lack of affordable medications imposes on public health. In fact, um, that awareness is what actually motivated me to pursue work in pharmaceutical health services research and in the public health field. Um, there's a lot, there are a lot of other stories that I could share with you today, but I really want to focus on the work that I have ended up doing with Dr. Simone Wastela while I am in the PHSR program which is the work in looking at um, prescription drug monitoring programs and how they impact opioid prescribing patterns. Although this work is really focusing on a US health policy issue, I've been surprised in many ways to find that local research and global health research are inextric inextricably intertwined, and that is something that has been unexpected for me because I, I joined the program thinking that, um, I, I joined the program knowing that I wanted to study how health policies impact public health. But at the time, I did not know what topic area I would focus that research in, and that, I, and that ended up being in prescription drug abuse. And that has been a very rewarding experience, um, learning about those issues in the US and how that's connected to global issues. And the next thing I'll talk about is why research is personal in my perspective. Research is personal because I, I have an aspiration to, in some way, find a way to, to make a difference in, in the place that I come from to the people in Zimbabwe or any other part of the world that may not be as fortunate to have really great infrastructure in terms of health systems and access to care. And so the work that I'm doing is personal in that way because I want to learn how other places can also learn to have better healthcare systems. And so um, that's why research is personal. I, I really want to um, pay, pay forward what I've learned and um, do my part in bettering other people's lives. And so thank you, Dr. Simone Wastila, for the opportunity to say a few words this afternoon. And thank you for being my mentor, our mentor, and congratulations on your award. Hi, uh, my name is Ida Kuzakin, and I'm a second year Dr. 
doctoral student. Um, I'm also a former pharmacy student, came from the School of Pharmacy. I got my pharmacy from here. So my path to becoming a student and a future researcher focused on medication use and their associated outcomes as a result of the, my past roles. I was a patient with a rare disease, a caretaker of an elderly grandparent, a daughter of a, suff a, daughter of a sufferer of mental illness, a neighbor of a person with a substance abuse disorder, an adolescent in a high school where cocaine, alcohol, and marijuana were considered normal passages of growth, a young adult at a university where Adderall was sold behind the main library on finals week, a clinical coordinator for an ambassador trial where I saw firsthand a patient's disappointment and joy all within the same trial, a pharmacist frustrated at the inability to enact global change, and most importantly, as a PharmD student mentee of Dr. Linda Simone Wistola, who showed me that through analysis of data, which is represented, representing all these people from all my interactions, work by me could lead to policies that enact global change. So thanks, Liz. Good afternoon. And it still feels weird being called doctor. It's, it hasn't settled in yet. It's only been a month, less than a month. But uh, my, thank you for giving the opportunity to speak. But my path to here, um, I could have, I don't think I could have ever imagined because I've just been so lucky. Um, why research is personal to me is because I grew up, even though I grew up in the US, I grew up in two cultures. Uh, I was born in Pakistan, but I grew up over here. So my parents were uh, very funny, and they still are. I'm a family, uh, pretty much. So I learned their culture, and I learned the US culture going, uh, going to school here, starting elementary school here. And I was always interested in society and how it works, uh, minorities, how they, how they tackle issues. And that's why I decided to do sociology. And why I decided to do medical sociology is because in high school, my closest friends were, um, were addicted to oxycodone, and then I saw how that impacted their social life, their, their personal life, and how I led to other drugs. And then also when I used to visit uh, Pakistan, I could see that how healthcare over there is run, so that what got me interested in healthcare policy, because it's totally different over here. I remember once I visited um, and I got sick because I eat all the unsanitary street food there is, um, because it's, <laughs> it's so delicious, but it's not good for you. <laughs> But I got sick, and I went to the emergency room, and I saw a doctor, had the lab test done, got the medications, and went out, and the bill for everything was 500 rupees, which translates to about $10 at that time. So all that for $10. So the healthcare policy, the healthcare is, is totally different over there. So I was interested in healthcare policy. So that's why I, I ended up uh, in UBC, getting a degree in medical sociology, and then I applied to a different school I didn't get into, and my advisor told me to check this out. And I, my first year, I did a rotation with Dr. Tony Fellows, I was interested in drug abuse. Two years later, I started working with her, and it's been great. Um, I've had the autonomy to do the research that I wanted, and focusing on the issues that I wanted. So, thank you so much, and congratulations. And as you, as you said, uh, you work together, and that's, that couldn't be more true, because even from a dissertation, if it wasn't for the help of the mentors, students, people outside of the program, inside of the program, no one is ever self-made. Uh, we have help from everyone. So thank you for that. I guess I switched myself back on. I just realized that was a moment. I think a moment. Yes, okay. I really want to thank you guys for sharing a little bit about that, about your, your journeys. I mean, it's minuscule, just getting a, a smattering of it. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how I got to where I'm at, briefly. For myself, I came to do what I do through a mix of nature and nurture. That's my mom and my dad. And I got my PhD from Brandeis. It was a fun day. 
Um, I was raised by two healthcare professionals. My mom was an ICU nurse. And my dad was a pharmacologist at a small company that doesn't exist anymore called Burroughs Welcome. He did, yeah, he did pharmacology on uh, anesthetics. And um, while well, most kids I knew growing up in North Carolina, they go home and they talk about things like what was going on at the church that weekend or what homework they had. The conversation around my dinner table went more like this, mom. Today, one of the patients coded on, on my watch. It was an older woman. We almost lost her. Dad, related to the anesthesia? <laughs> Mom, possibly. She had apnea while in recovery, and they brought her up to ICU too early. I think she looked awfully blue, and I said, bring her back to recovery. She's not ready. And they said, no, recovery's packed. Dad, those anesthesiologists, <laughs> they should consider using shorter-acting anesthetics, like but anyways, it's not really a job. That was one of his drugs. But um, that's, I grew up around that language of medications and medicine and patients. And so it was a given that by the time I hit high school, I would definitely you know, be going into the healthcare field. Um, and I wanted to go to medical school. I wanted to be like my dad. I wanted to be a doctor. Um, and I thought the best way to do that was through pharmacy school. But something really funny happened on the way to the MCATs. And that was, I spent my last summer in pharmacy school working as a co-step intern for the public health service. Before, I didn't even know what public health was. I thought it was just a bunch of people who went around to the McDonald's to make sure sanitation was okay. Um, I knew there was a building next door to the School of Pharmacy in Chapel Hill that said School of Public Health, but I didn't know what they did. So um, I was assigned to the Assistant Surgeon General of Pharmacy services, which is fantastic. Um, he gave me a broad tour of duty. I went all over the country. It was a real life-changing experience for me. I, at the National Institutes of Health, I worked with a tremendous public health pharmacist named Jim Miner, who asked me what clinical area I was interested in. And I said I was interested in autoimmune diseases. Arthritis and lupus run through my family like kudzu through North Carolina soybean fields. So he said, hmm. I don't think we'll find lupus and arthritis here. We have this mystery disease. It's, it's all in all two floors of the clinical center. Why don't you check this out? Of course, that disease turned out to be HIV AIDS. It was before they knew what it was. Um, we had people with Kaposi's and extreme pneumonia and people wasting away. And we didn't know what it was. It actually thought it was viral at the time. But from that experience, um, I learned about epidemiology. I learned about how AIDS and HIV were tracked by the Centers for Disease Control, how cataloging symptoms and blood levels and sexual contacts at the epicenter showed where everything began and how it spread. I found out who was at risk and how the disease progressed, and I became a nerd. I became a complete geek because I found out that epidemiology, which I couldn't spell or say at the time, was a tremendous field. And that really is what got me into population research, is understanding that there are these tools to that we could use to, to track disease and to monitor disease. I then spent the next six weeks of that summer at the Indian Health Service, stationed in White River, Arizona, Apache land. This opened my eyes to another world completely, one I thought only existed in other developing countries or even third world countries like Haiti. This is where I began to understand that the healthcare system that most of us take for granted simply doesn't work for everyone. It is also where I came to understand that there were multiple tiers of care and that some individuals weren't going to accept any of the health care that we could offer them as a society. I also came to understand what was meant by the word or the term vulnerable populations. I never went to medical school. I trekked up the hill from pharmacy school and completed my master's of science in public health, and I never looked back. I continued to do a PhD in health policy because I was really geeked out at that point with data and methods and epidemiology. Um, because the idea of understanding and possibly treating health problems in large numbers of people and populations intrigued me and seemed as important a modality as treating patients one at a time. As a researcher, I know what I know. I am what I know. Like I am what I eat. I am what I know. And what I know is this, I know COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, because my mother, her sister, and her parents all contracted this awful respiratory disease from smoking. I know about pain. 
because my father passed from a stage four sinus cancer that lasted almost two years. I have substance use disorders because, well, those smokers, but also because my family tree is completely laden with its share of alcoholics, gamblers, and laudanum users. I know mental health because I myself suffer from depression and anxiety, as do other members of my family. I know Alzheimer's disease and related dementias because my grandfather died stuck in a happier time war, believing he was a young man who angled for salmon and trout in New England rivers. These people, these experiences, and these disorders all shape all I do and continue to do. The past informs my present and my future. I research what I know and experience. I do so with intent and purpose. I am subjective with my research goals, and I hope you are as well. Is that quite over? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to end this with a huge thank you. I love the work that I do, and I feel incredibly blessed to be able to come to this campus every day, except weekends, um, where I can scratch my curiosity itch and feel like maybe, just maybe, I am making a difference to someone. UMB is a rich place to work. So many brilliant and compassionate and generous people here. And I'm so happy to be here. President Perman, I'd really like to thank you for leaving this place to higher levels of excellence. And I want to thank people in your office, Nancy Gordon for saying, Holly Beer and others, um, for the work for Founders Week and for helping me with this whole festivity thing, so thank you. I'd like to thank the School of Pharmacy for supporting my work for the past 15 years. And I know because 15 years today is when I came on campus for the first time. It's my 15 year anniversary. Yay. It's the longest place I've ever stayed. And um, also for continuously providing inspiration and resources. I'm proud to be a faculty member of this institution, which is 175 years strong this year. And it will endure, I am sure, for at least another 175. And a huge thank you to, dean, to the dean, Dean Edmonton, because um, you've always believed in me and my work. And to all my colleagues in the school and across campus, thank you. We've had fun and will continue to have fun. But most of all, I'd like to thank my trainees and my students, both past and present. I learned so much from you all, and I'd especially like to thank Ida Babal and Patience for sharing a bit of their lives among the field by the journey. Now we're done. Let's go reset. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, I am really interested still in substance use, particularly prescription drug abuse. Um, my fear is that we're focusing so much on opioids, we're forgetting about other substances. My fear also is that we're focusing so much on young people, we're forgetting about middle-aged and older adults. I um, love the geriatric field, and this is a population that, you know, it's, it's okay, Granny, Granny can have her drink, she's fine, you know, she's old, you'll need to deal with her alcohol problems. And I, I think that's looking at alcohol, um, substance use, alcohol use, and mental health problems in older adults is really what's fueling me right now. Especially with, once again, the reliance on medications, which are great if used appropriately, but can have such deleterious effects on folks who are already frail. Thank you. Thank you. What did you mean about the delicate balance between using your research to influence advocacy? There's nothing wrong with using your research to influence advocacy. You hope that advocates would take your research and use it. The de balance I mean is between being a researcher and being an advocate. If you become so enamored of your own agenda, then your research becomes too biased and people will not necessarily take your research for what it, it, it is, for what, it, for what it's saying. So there's a fine line there between doing the research. You have to be subjective. You're there doing subjective work. But to be an advocate, you can advocate your work, but to become an advocate in terms of like lobbying with your work and all that, it's a very fine balance between doing that if you want to be taken as a credible researcher. Yes, hi, Madonna. Um, I know you're proud of all the research you've done, but if you had to single out something you did that you are extremely proud of and that it created a policy change that you wanted, what would that be? Oh my goodness. What would, what's the thing I'm proudest of that created policy change? I, I, I think there's two answers to that. One is a moment. Um, for me, it was actually a two-day moment when I was at the Food and Drug Administration as a, one of the advisory council when they were talking about rescheduling Vicodins from Schedule 3 to Schedule 2. And it was, as you can imagine, a very contentious, contentious um, event. Um, and the Vicodin and other combination opioid products were rescheduled to Schedule 2. And I was one of the 19 who voted for rescheduling it. Um, but I, so that moment was really important to me on a, on a personal level because I saw Vicodin, you know, it's, it was an opioid of choice on the streets. Um, it was overused, and so I was really happy about that. But I think that's a moment, but I think more long term, I think it's my work with the Behavioral Health Administration, firm, formerly the Alcohol and Drug Abuse Administration at DHMH, um, just helping them think about using data as evidence to guide their policy, how resources are, are allocated in prevention. That's most of the work I do is in the prevention group and the population health group. Um, thinking about populations that are at risk, how can we make a difference? Um, I'm the data, I don't do a lot of the interventions. We have another faculty member and group that does that in our department, but I provide the data and my team provides, the, helps me with the data and I think informing the state about what we do with that data and what, who's at risk for substance use disorders and now increasingly the overlap with mental health because finally the federal government has said, oh yeah, substance use is mental health. And the state has sounded like, yeah, it's that, so that way. So it's trickling down so that we're actually looking at more than one comorbidity. Uh, morbidity, but thank you. Now we've reset? Oh no. <laughs> I don't have a question. I just want to thank you for this journey that you shared with us on your research endeavors and the impact that you've had. Let's give her another round. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So that you can spend some more time with Linda, we have a reception outside in the Walsh Gallery. So please make sure you stop and get something to eat because we paid for the food. <laughs> Thank you.